Hello. So we're at chapter 35, Children, Blood, and Bone. We're finally in Enan's perspective again, after all that back and forth between Amari and Zeli. The desert air is lifeless. It cuts with each inhale. Without Kia's steady instruction, every breath blurs together, marred by the magic that took her away. I never realized how riding alongside Kia passed the time. Traveling alone, minutes merge into hours. Days blend into nights. The flute food supply dwindles first. Water follows close behind. I grab the canteen hooked to the saddle of my stolen panthenaire and squeeze the last droplets out. If Ori is really watching me from above, he must be laughing now. Magi attack, Kia killed, pursuing the scroll. I. The message I sent home with the soldier should arrive soon. Knowing father, he'll dispatch the guards the moments he receives it, order them to return with the culprit's head or not at all. Little does he know, the monster he hunts is me. Guilt rips at my insides like the magic I fight back. Father will never understand the extent to which I'm already punishing myself. Skies. My head rings as I push my magic down, deep into my bones, further than I ever knew it could go. Now it's just an ache in my chest or a winded breath that I fight. It's a constant tremor shaking my hands, the burning hatred in Kia's eyes, the venom in her final word, maggot. I hear it again and again, a hell I can't escape. With that one foul word, Kia might as well have declared me unfit to be king. The slur disparages everything I've ever worked for. The duty I fight to fulfill, the destiny Kia herself forced upon me. Damn it! I close my eyes against the memories of her that day. It was Kia who found me after I heard Amari, tucked in the darkest corner of my room, clutching the bloody blade. When I threw the sword to the floor, Kia placed it back into my hands. You're strong, Enan, she smiled. Do not let that strength scare you. You will need it all your life. You'll need it to be king. Strength, I scoff. It's that very strength I need now. I only used magic to protect my kingdom. Key of all people should have understood that. Sand whips at my face as I pass the clay walls of a veggie. I force thoughts of Kia away. She's dead. I can't change that. The threat of magic still lives. Kill her. In the dead of night, I'd expect the desert settlement to be asleep, but the streets of Abeji swell with the remnants of some celebration. Low-ranking nobles and villagers pull generous swigs from their cups, each drunker than the last. At times, they cry out mythic names cheering for the lion heir, the commander, or the immortal. None pay any mind to the disheveled soldier who rides in their mist or waste a glance at the dried blood coating my skin. No one realizes that I am their prince. I pull on my panthenaire's reins, stopping before a villager who looks sober enough to remember his own name. I reach to pull out the wrinkled poster. Then I catch the scent of the sea. Though I've pushed every part of my curse down, it hits, distinct like an ocean breeze. It strikes me like the first drop of water in days. Suddenly it all comes together. She's here. I yank on the reins and urge the panthenaire toward the scent. Kill her. Kill magic. Get my life back. I slide to a stop in an alleyway lined with sandahedes. The smell of the sea is overpowering now. She's here, hiding behind one of these doors. My throat tightens as I dismount the panthenaire and unsheath my sword. Its blade catches the moonlight. I kick down the first door. What are you doing? A woman cries. Even with the haze slowing my thoughts, I can see it's not her, not the girl, not what I need. I breathe deep and search again, letting the sea salt scent guide my way. It's this door, this Ahiti, the only thing standing in my way. I kick down the clay door and run forward, teeth bared in a growl. I raise my sword to fight. No one's here. Folded sheets and old clothes line the walls, all stained with blood, but the hut is empty filled only with shed lion air fur and the unmistakable scent of the girl. Hey, a man shouts from outside. I don't turn to look. She was here in this city, in this hut, and now she's gone. You can't just, a 
hand grips my shoulder. In an instant, my own hands are around the man's throat. He lets out a yelp as I point my blade at his heart. Where is she? I don't know who you're talking about, he cries. I draw my blade across his chest. A thin, blood of, a thin line of blood appears. His tears almost look silver in the moonlight. Maggot, the girl whispers with Kia's voice. You'll never be king. You can't even catch me. I tighten my grip on the man's neck. Where is she? Okay, so we just finished chapter 35. So Enan's getting closer and closer as he pulls to her, but now he's on his own and has nobody there to sort of support him. He's all alone in his thoughts. He's always been alone in his thoughts, but now he's physically alone as well. So chapter 36 is Zelly's perspective. After the six days traveling through the hell of the desert, the lush forest of the Gombe River Valley are a welcome sight. The hilly land breathes with life, filled with trees so wide one trunk could fit an entire Ahiti. We weave in and out of the towering giants, moonlight spilling through their leaves as we travel toward a winding river. Its quiet roar hits my ears like a soft, like a song, soft like the crafts from ocean waves. This is so soothing, Amari purrs. I know, it's almost like being back home. I close my eyes and take in the trickling sound, letting it fill me with the calm that came in the early morning spent drawing the fishing net with Baba. That far out at sea, it was like we lived in our own world. It was the only time I truly felt safe. Not even the guards could touch us. My muscles relax as I settle into the memory. I haven't felt this still in weeks. With the sacred artifacts scattered and Enon's sword at our backs, every second felt stolen, borrowed at best. We didn't have what we needed for the ritual and the chances of us getting the artifacts were far smaller than the chances of getting killed. But now we have it all. The scroll, the sunstone, and the bone dagger are safe in our grasp. For once, I feel more than at ease. With six days until the centennial solstice, I finally feel that we can win. Do you think they'll tell stories about us? Amari asks. About us? They better, Dizane snorts. With all the dung we've had to wade through for this magic, we better get a whole festival. Where would the story even start? Amari chews on her bottom lip. What would they call it? The magic summoners, the restorers of magic and the sacred artifacts? That doesn't have a ring to it. I scrunch my nose and recline on Nayla's furry back. A title like that will never withstand the test of time. What about something simpler? Dizane offers. The princess and the fisherman. That sounds like a love story. I roll my eyes. I can hear the smile in Amari's voice. I have no doubt that if I sat up, I would catch Tazane smiling as well. It does sound like a love story, I tease, but that's not accurate. If you want a love story so bad, why not call it The Princess and the Agbon Player? Amari whips her head around, a flush rising to her cheeks. I didn't mean I, I wasn't trying to say. Her mouth clamps shut before she can choke out anything else. Tazane shoots me a glare, but it lacks true malice. As we approach the Gombe River, I can't decide whether it's endearing or annoying how the smallest taunt makes them both clam up. Gods, it's a beast! I slide down Nayla's tail and find my footing over the large, smooth stones lining the muddy bank. The water stretches wide, curving a path through the heart of the forest and the trunks of massive trees. I kneel down on the mud and bring the water to my lips. Remembering the way my throat burned for it in the desert, the ice-cold water feels so good in this humid air that I'm tempted to thrust my entire face in. Zell not yet, Tizane says. There will be water up ahead. We still have a ways to go. I know, but just take a sip. Nayla could use the rest. I rub Nayla's horn and nuzzle my face against her neck, grinning when she nuzzles me back. Even she hated the desert. Since we've left, she's had an extra spring in her step. For Nayla, Tizane concedes. Not for you. He jumps down and crouches by the river, careful as he fills up his canteen. A smile spreads across my lips. The opportunity is too great to resist. Oh my God, I point. What's that? What? I ram into his body. Tizane yells as he topples over, hitting the river with a splash. Amari gasps when Tizane reemerges, soaked, teeth chattering with the cold. 
He locks eyes with me, a wicked grin breaking through. You're dead. You have to catch me first. Before I can take off, Desane lunges forward, grabbing me by the leg. I shriek as he pulls me under. The water's so cold it hits my skin like Mama Agba's wooden needles. Gods! I sputter for air. Was it worth it? Tazane laughs. That's the first time I've tricked you in ages, so I'm going to have to say yes. Amari jumps down from Nayla, giggling as she shakes her head. You two are ridiculous. Tazane's grin turns mischievous. We're a team, Amari. Shouldn't you be ridiculous too? Absolutely not. Amari backs away, but she doesn't stand a chance. Tazane rises from the water like an Arishan river python. Amari only gains a few meters before he hunts her down. I smile as she squeals with laughter, spouting every excuse she can think of when Tazane throws her over his back. I can't swim. It's not that deep, he laughs. I'm a princess. Don't princesses bathe? I have the scroll. She takes it out of her waistband, reminding Tazane of his own strategy. To keep all of the artifacts from being in one place, he carries the bone dagger, Amari holds the scroll, and I guard the sunstone. Good point. Tazane snatches the scroll out of her hand and places it on Nayla's saddle. And now, your majesty, your royal bath awaits. Tazane, no! Amari's shriek is so loud that the birds fly out of the trees in alarm. Tazane and I burst into laughter as she crashes into the water, flailing around although she can stand. It's not funny, Amari shivers, grinning in spite of herself. You're going to pay for that. A new kind of smile rises to my face, one that warms me even as I sit on the bank of the freezing river. It's been far too long since I've seen my brother play. Amari fights in earnest to dunk him under the water, though she can't be more than half his weight soaking wet. Tazane entertains her, crying out in pretend pain, pretending she might win. Suddenly the river vanishes. The trees, Nayla, Tazane, the world spins around me as a familiar force carries me away. When the spinning stops, reeds tickle my feet. Brisk air fills my lungs. By the time I realize I'm in the prince's dreamscape, I'm thrust back into the real world. I wheeze, clutching my chest as the cold of the river hits my feet again. The flash of the dreamscape only lasted a moment, but it was powerful, stronger than it's ever felt. A chill strikes my core as the realization settles in. Enan isn't just in my dreams. He's close. We have to go. Tizane and Amari are laughing too loudly to hear me. He's lifted her once again, threatening to throw her back in. Stop! I kick water in them. We have to go. We're not safe here. What are you talking about? Amari giggles. It's Enan. I rush out. He's close. My voice chokes in my throat. A distant noise pounds near. Our heads whip toward the sound, thumping and constant. At first, I can't decipher it, but as it approaches, I recognize the steady patter of paws. When they round the river bend, I finally see what I, see what I feared most. Enan speeds towards us, rabid on his panthenaire. Shock slows my steps as we scramble out of the river. The water that once held our joy weighs us down. Current strong now that Amari and Tizane fight to get out. We're idiots. How could we be so foolish? The very second we let ourselves relax is the second Enan finally catches us. But how did Enan get over the broken bridge at Chandoble? How did he know where to go? Even if he somehow tracked us to a veggie, we left that hell six nights ago. I race over to Nayla and mount first, gripping her reins tight. Zane and Amari quickly scramble up behind me. Before I snap the leather, I turn around. What have I missed? Where are the guards he traveled with before? The Admiral killed Lakin. After surviving a Centauro's attack, surely Enan wouldn't strike without backup. But despite all reasonable logic, no other guards shoot forth. The little prince is vulnerable, alone, and I can take him in a fight. What are you doing? Zane screams as I release Nayla's reins, drawing her to a halt before we even start. I got this. Zelly, no but I don't turn back. I throw my pack to the ground and jump off Nayla's back, landing in a crouch. Enan halts his own rider and dismounts, sword brandished and ready for blood. With a growl, the panthenaire lopes off, but Enan hardly seems to notice. 
Crimson stains haunt his uniform. A desperation burns in his amber eyes, and yet he looks thinner. Fatigue rises from his skin like heat. Something crazed shifts in his gaze. Suppressing his powers has left him weak. Wait! Amari's voice quivers. Though Tizane tries to hold her back, she slides off Nayla's saddle. Her nimble feet hit the ground without making a sound, tentative as they walk past me. Color drains from Amari's face, and I see the fear that's plagued her all her life. The girl who grabbed me all those weeks ago in the market, the princess with the scar traveling down her back. But as she moves, something different sets into her stance. Something steady like on the arena ship. It allows her to approach her brother, concern eclipsing the terror in her eyes. What happened? Enan redirects his sword from my chest to Amari's. Tizane jumps down to fight, but I grab his arm. Let her try. Out of my way. Enan's voice is commanding, but a tremble shakes his hand. Amari pauses for a second, illuminated by the moonlight reflecting off Enan's blade. Father's not here, she finally says. You won't hurt me. You don't know that. Maybe you don't, Amari swallows hard. But I do. Enan is silent for a long moment. Still. Too still. The clouds shift and moonlight shines, lighting the space between them. Amari takes a step forward. Then another, bigger this time. When she places a hand on Enan's cheek, tears fill his amber eyes. You don't understand, he croaks, still clenching his sword. It destroyed her. It'll destroy all of us. Her. Whether or not Amari knows who Enid's talking about, she doesn't seem to care. She guides his sword to the ground as if soothing a wild animal. For the first time, I notice how different she and her brother truly look. The contrast in her round face, the angles of Enid's square jawline, though they share the same amber gaze and copper complexion. That seems to be where the similarities end. Those are father's words, Enid. His decisions, not yours. We are our own people. We make our own choices. But he's right, Enan's voice cracks. If we don't stop magic, Orisha will fall. His eyes return to me, and I tighten my grip on my staff. Try it. I want to bark. I'm done running away. Amari redirects Enan's line of vision, her delicate hands cupping the back of his head. Father is not the future of Orisha, brother. We are. We stand on the right side of this. You can stand here too. Enan stares at Amari and for a moment, I don't know who he is. The ruthless captain, the little prince, the scared and broken magi. There's a longing in his eyes, a desire to give up the fight. But when he lifts his chin, the killer I know comes back. Amari, I cry out. Enan pushes her aside and lunges forward sword raised to my chest. I jump in front of Tizane with my staff brandished. Amari tried. Now it's my turn. The air rings as Enan's sword hits the metal of my staff. I expect a chance to counterattack, but now that the true Enan's awakened, he won't let up. Though fatigued, his blows are fierce, fueled by a hatred of me, a hatred of what I know. Yet as I defend against each strike, my own rage builds. The monster who burned my village. The man responsible for Lakin's death. The root of all of our problems. And I can wipe him away. I see you took my advice. I yell, somersaulting to dodge the strike of his blade. I can barely see your streak. How many coats this time, little prince? I swipe my staff at his skull, striking to kill, not maim. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of him getting in our way. He ducks to avoid my staff, but he's quick to thrust his sword at my gut. I spin out of harm's way and strike. Once again, our weapons collide with a piercing clink. You won't win, I hiss, arms shaking under the force. Killing me won't change what you are. Doesn't matter. Eden jumps back, freeing himself for another blow. If you die, magic dies too. He runs forward and raises his sword with a cry. You just finished chapter 36. So again, take a moment, summarize what happened in the chapter and think about 
what is Eden truly experiencing and what is this massive growth that we're really trying to see or starting to see um, with Amari here as well going through. So pause on that, take your notes, and then continue on to chapter 37.